Hi. You are. Ready Welcome to, to Chat with Green Aggies. It's 12, 12 or 12, 13 now, and it is the fifth Thursday of the month. So we're going to have a real chatty chat today. Um, we uh, asked for questions. We didn't get a whole lot of questions. We got a, a few topics, suggestions um, that are interesting. Uh, one was, you know, wanting to talk a little bit more about soils and nutrition, wanting to talk more about trees. So we'll kind of do those things. We didn't get a real specific question to address. So we all kind of just scoured our emails and, you know, came up with some things that people are sending us. And that's, that's kind of how we're going to do things today. But we do want to invite you all to ask some questions um, more than you usually do. And uh, if you want to unmute your mic, uh, let us know. We can do that. If you want to talk, um, if you want to put something in the chat, as always, that's great. I'm going to introduce my my fellow chat chatters today and uh, uh, welcome you all. So uh, right below me on my screen, I see Dr. Erfan Vafai, who's going to uh, share one of his recently published uh, papers with us, and we'll talk about that a little bit. And it's a real interesting thing. Uh, I am I am especially looking forward to talking about one part of it that I, that really fascinated me. I think you know. All right. Um, and then Chrissy Seegers, Dr. Chrissy Seegers is is joining us from Dallas, and I think she's been getting some questions about. <laughs> about weed control in the spring and some different things that, that we're going to discuss. Um, my colleague, Mr. Paul Winsky is joining us from Harris County and he's uh, got some, some warm weather down there in Harris County. Paul? Yeah, yeah it is warming up. That's for sure. We're, we, and the humidity is here also. So yes, yes, we are ready. Yes. And as I told someone today, it is great snail and slug weather around here. Anyway, it's nice and moist. Um, Becky, Dr. Becky Bowling also joining us from Dallas. She's our, our urban water specialist. We're getting some urban water right here in Fort Worth right now. <laughs> yeah. A lot of urban water. A lot of urban water. And uh, Dr. Meng Meng Gu joining us from College Station. Um, and, you know, if you wanted to talk about jujubes, I think you're in luck. <laughs> she, she's thrown a few in there. And Dr. Carlos Bogran, our, our friend with OHP, joining us also. Are you in College Station, Carlos? Or yes, you yes, I am. About? Okay. Carlos is also in College Station today, and, and he's a, a great resource for us. And um, we'll just Thank you. chat away. So. Have at it, folks. Okay, well, just want to remind you all that you can go to YouTube and watch old episodes of Chat with Green Aggies. <laughs> if you have trouble sleeping or <laughs> you miss something. <laughs> And today, today is our big day, Bring It Growers, where we ask you to bring us your questions, bring us your problems so that we can talk about them. And this is really kind of how we started Chat with Green Aggies, just kind of, you know, pulling out some things that people were asking us and, and, and giving it a go. And so it's a, it's a fun thing to do for us. So. All right. Ah, GGVs, just as I promised. All right, Dr. Gru, take it away. I, am I the first? <laughs> Erifo, you probably uh, changed the the the, the, order. the order of the uh, of the jujubes. I, okay. I did not. I'm pretty you sure not. you put jujubes put front and center intentionally. I, I, yeah, I put yeah. my paper first, and you moved it. You moved your jujubes <laughs> right above. She actually, it. she actually deleted all of our slides, guys. We're she just did. talking about jujubes. There's, jujubes. There's now oh, 50 no. jujube <laughs> slides. All all jujubes all the time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, um, so the interest, I have to tell you this, the interest on jujubes is just increasing, uh, increasing. Skyrocketing. Already. Skyrocketing. Yes, 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 yes. Thank you. <laughs> it just literally, it just go through the roof, you know, a uh, skyrocketing. Um, so I got this contact um, about, you know, a grower want to devote about two acres of land to grow jujubes and, you know, any suggestion uh, for a source for trees, uh, you know, definitely, you know, for two acres or, or more, you want to go with a wholesale, you want to go with a wholesale um, uh, nurseries. Uh, right now, uh, you know, a lot of retail nurseries, they're selling uh, jujube uh, plants. Uh, 
uh, at a 50 to $80 a plant, 50 to $80 a plant. And, uh, and uh, I mean, if anyone want to order, you know, from those online nurseries, they're gone, they're completely out, out of stock and all that kind of thing. And when I uh, ordered last year, uh, there's nothing last year, there's nothing this year, the earliest that the wholesale nursery can provide some me, you know, prov provide my uh, me some um, jujube plants was in it will be in 2022. And even for 2022, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting on their catalog, it says, you know, maybe limited quantity and all that kind of thing. So, so this is definitely a uh, hot uh, item. It's definitely a hot item, you know, um, on a lot of uh, nurseries uh, 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 list. Um, I want to give credit uh, uh, to Dr. Uh, Shangri Yao at uh, New Mexico State University. Uh, she has been hosting, she has been trialing Jujube and hosting a uh, Jujube workshops, and, uh, you know, at, uh, you know, based on her research um, in New Mexico State. And I mean, who wouldn't want to go to uh, this kind of workshop, uh, you know, where you get to taste a lot of different cultivars of jujube um, yeah, fruits. So um, the, she published quite a few papers on, you know, the jujube growth, you know, cult, cult, uh, cultivar difference and stuff like that. And here's a summary from one of her papers. Uh, so uh, cultivars like Li, Li Tu, Redland, uh, qi yue xian, uh, xian zao, tea pod, uh, da gua zao were self-pollinating. I'm sorry, can you repronounce that? I just I missed that a little bit there, Meng Meng. <laughs> Which one? Are you serious? Tea pod. Okay, maybe all like of it. Tea pod. Tea pod. Oh, Li, no. uh, Li too. <laughs> <laughs> so, I think I might need like a one hour lesson just to try and pronounce yeah, that Yeah, just to try and, uh, yeah. <laughs> and, and if you look at her paper, you know, I think she's testing like 30, 40 cultivars, um, you know, uh, and many of those are from, uh, from China. She, uh, you know, went through the whole importation, you know, phyto certification, th those, those uh, process. And she got those in and being trialing those. And she also has some, you know, the, some long standing one from the, the, the US. Um, so, so the lead, you know, these cultivars are self-pollinating and self-fruitful. So that means, you know, you only need this one uh, cultivar to have fruits. And for open pollination, uh, fruit sets vary uh, varied greatly by cultivars. And Abbeville, uh, Abbeville had the best fruit set each year. And most cultivars had better fruit set from open pollination than self-pollination. Uh, However, a self fruitful cultivar Lee, uh, Lee Two, and Redland had better fruit set with you know with self pollination than open pollination in some years, and open pollination increased uh, fruit size for all cultivars. So I guess the message is you know for you know if open pollination increased uh, fruit size for all cultivars and many of these cultivars, you know they benefit they ha have a better uh, fruit set from open pollination. I guess the take home message is, you know, uh, plant more uh, cultivars for, uh, you know, open pollination for cross pollination to get, uh, you know, better um, fruit set and also a larger uh, fruit size. Well, the cultivar Li is probably the most widely available, would you say? Well, Li and Lang, Lang are the yeah. most available in the US. Uh, uh, it, yes, here. And in her paper, and you notice that uh, that Lang, you know, is I mean, I, I did not list Lang in, in 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 the information, you know, in this list of information because uh, Lang, uh, some people think that they are self pollinating, but from her research uh, showing that Lang is actually not so uh, self pollinating. So uh, so yeah, so Lee and Lang are two of the, the most popular. And I think mainly because that the fruit size are fairly big, you know, and who wouldn't like a big fruit size and look at my mug, see how big my mug is. Um, next, please. 
So uh, if you are, you know, close to where I am, uh, the uh, jujube are flowering right now in the Houston area. In the Houston area, uh, you may already see like little pea size. Um, can you all see my mouse? No, yeah. no, but you should be able to annotate. Um, That's true. That's true. I can annotate. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so these little green things, you know, those are the flowers. Um, interesting that jujube has two types of uh, uh, flowers based on when they open. They have the morning open types and the evening open types. Um, maybe you know this particular tree is a uh, uh, you know afternoon open. Did I say morning and evening? Sorry, it's it's morning and afternoon open type. So this particular one is uh, you know is um, afternoon open type, and and the reason I'm saying that I don't know this for sure because I have never seen um, honeybees. I have never seen honeybees uh, get in either pollen or nectar uh, from these flowers, but uh, I've seen plenty of. Um, wasp ID for uh, for Airfong and Carlos. <laughs> <laughs> so so I have seen plenty of this type of wasps or flies or ants, you know, getting on the flowers, probably, you know, getting uh, into the, the nectar. Um, I don't know what types they are, uh, what types of wasps uh, they are. Uh, but these things, you know, uh, these uh, little creatures could be um, you know, helping with the uh, with the uh, pollination, uh, self pollination. If there's just only one tree, but uh, cross pollination. You know, if there are multiple trees, uh, the the uh, jujube flowers are definitely not showy. I mean, it's not even big, and you can tell from the size of these wasps. Uh, but they're actually very fragrant. Um, I remember um, when I was in China, a jujube honey. Is is a uh, is a highly sought after honey you know, compared to some other type of honeys. Uh, and I do want to mention uh, one of the benefits about jujube, and you notice that they are flowering right now uh, at the end of uh, April. Um, so there's you know even with the um, the frost warning, frost damage that some. Uh, other plants were experiencing about last week, you know, 10 days ago, uh, you know, jujube uh, normally do not have that risk. I also need to point out that this is the case in College Station, the flower in the status right now, like this is in College Station in Houston. Uh, you know, they may have a small pea size uh, fruit and in Dallas, Fort Worth area, I have seen reports saying that uh, they're not even leaving out. If they're not leaving out, then they definitely are not going to experience any of the danger of, um, of Easter freeze or something like that. Um, can we move to the next slide? Yeah, uh, just before I do, you know, Meng Meng, you kept saying that you added some slides with jujube flowers. And I and, and you said that they're not very showy, and and uh, I kept going past a slide, wondering where are those <laughs> slides with the flowers? I don't where see are the, the flowers? flowers. I was like, did where they get are... added? Are you sure? Did they save in there? Because <laughs> I did not see the flowers in there. Where are the flowers? <laughs> yeah, like oh well, she says they're in there. <laughs> <laughs> she probably just lied to me. She probably just lied to me. Just... Yeah. <laughs> um. Some people like uh, to eat uh, jujube fresh, but when you have two acres or uh, 10 acres of jujube or something like that, uh, you know, when um, uh, fresh eating, it just, you could eat or sell only so much uh, for uh, fresh eating jujubes, there's a way just to dry jujubes. And, and Dr. Yao also has a uh, peer review publication, uh, no, peer review publication on performance in, of drying and multi-purpose jujube cultivars. And I have the, um, the link, I, I will put the link of this paper in the chat so that you all will have access uh, to, you know, to her paper. 
And on this one, and there are uh, there are many uh, names. Uh, there are many many names. Uh, these are some of the cultivars that you know she uh, tried. But these are for drying and multi-purpose. So that means they may or may not uh, taste great for uh, fresh eating. And for jujube, what I would consider as a great cultivar would be uh, one is big. Second is sweet. Now, big is actually the last one that I'm looking for. So thank you, Airfang, for posting that uh, link of the, uh, of the paper. So the first one is sweet, crunchy, and then big. And I can accept, you know, some fruits who are, which are not so big. I'm okay with that. But some people may want something big. So it just depends on what, you, uh, what your preference is. Uh, next. Oh, can we go back? Can we go back, Airfang? So on this one, I put jujube, zizifus jujuba. So this is the common name. Some people call it Chinese red date or Chinese date or something. So this is zizifus jujuba. This is uh, more suitable for zone six to eight or six to nine. And then next slide, please. Meng Meng, you should be able to clear your own oh. annotations. I don't know if you have, if it says anything like clear annotations or not. There you go. Yeah, perfect. All right, go ahead. So the next one is uh, uh, Zizifus uh, Morita, Moritania. Ah, uh, this is even, uh, this is definitely harder than uh, Chinese for me to pronounce. So this, uh, I want to show you the size. The, uh, the size is generally, the size is generally uh, bigger or bigger than the, the, the largest jujube cultivar, the red date, the Zizifus jujuba cultivar. And it looks almost like a small apple. And um, this one um, flower in the, um, what well, depend on where you are, but you know, like summer, fall, and then the fruits are ready uh, in the winter time, say um, uh, November, December. So this is definitely comes, you know, this fruit definitely comes in a place where uh, there are not that many fruits, other fruits available. And the, so this one, the Ziphus Mauritania is, um, is not cold hardy at all. Uh, at the very minimum, very minimum, it's a zone nine, but probably more suitable for zone 10. So I will consider this one, you know, it's, it may be even less hardy uh, than the, um, it's, it's probably less hardy than the most hardy citrus plants like um, uh, satsumas. So, you know, um, could, where the citrus, where the oranges could grow. So that's where this type of jujube uh, could grow. It, it's definitely a, uh, you know, more South Texas. It's a more South Texas type of uh, fruit. So um, that's all I have airphone for jujubes. All right. Let's see. Um, so I've been getting some emails about uh, difficulties managing spider mites. And this is not uncommon. I think there are a problem year after year. We're starting to have more and more rise of insectic or miticide resistance issues. So you can see here this chart. This comes from, I think it's Michigan State University has this database where you can pull... Um, you know, number of cases of resistance to insecticides, depending on the organism you're looking at. So just like incredibly fun database to dig through. And uh, so here you can see on the far right is the number of published resistance cases uh, for each of these species. So if we go down to two spotted spider mite, which is one of the really common ones we see, there's over 550 published cases of resistance. Like that's just what's been published. And it's getting to the point where some of our producers, which may, may include some of y'all, are having great difficulty getting any efficacy from insecticides. Um, so at this point, you kind of need to resort back potentially to some of your more uh, like mechanical type insecticides, such as insecticidal soaps or oils, which are not incredibly effective, uh, especially because spider mites are hard to reach. Um, usually they are in places that are hard to target. And so uh, you need very good coverage. And so I also have... Um, started developing kind of, uh, you know, if you've attended some of our previous chat with Green Aggies, 
I've provided tables on, um, you know, current uh, uh, insecticides for white flies or thrips based on efficacy data. So this is not a fully comprehensive list, but these these up here are um, insecticides uh, with with trials on broad mite. And the source here is IR4 Project, which is a federally funded program that helps bring pesticides to the specialty crop and horticultural industry. And so uh, based on these IR4 studies, you can see how well some of these uh, miticides are you know, supposed to work. So feel free to take a quick screenshot of this if you so wish. It's just a bit of a guide. Again, it's not on a fully comprehensive list. But you can see there's some like spiromesophen that work uh, excellent. We have things like pylon combined with ultra, ultra pure oil, which also work excellent. We have a few others um, that, that are going to give uh, at least good control. Abamectin, also excellent. Mind you, some of these, again, like abamectin, we're, we're getting um, at least anecdotal anecdotal reports that it's not working nearly as effectively in some regions due to insect uh, miticide resistance. Um, going down to spider spider mite, we're seeing some similar, um, uh, some similar insecticides uh, as, as the broad mite, but some additional ones too that um, have shown some good to excellent efficacy. And the main thing is here, we want to rotate these modes of action. So you can see I'm still actually filling out this chart. So this is a a fresh chart because these questions have just been coming in. But make sure that when you're spraying, you are rotating. Otherwise, we're going to keep losing um, tools that are considered effective for, for managing spider mites. Hey, your uh, fan, just, just to know. Yeah, that. please. You have Ovation there. Uh, mm -hmm. that, uh, uh, that product is now called Notavo. Noctavo? No. Notavo. It's like Notavo. ovation backwards, but without the eye. Oh, interesting. Okay. Perfect. -O -O. Thank you so much. -O. All right. Perfect. Notavo. I will, I will yeah. update that. Everyone, I just wanted to clarify. So these are products labeled for spider mites exclamation point. So maybe not necessarily for spider mites period, right? Correct. Yeah. So those are like spider mites. Yeah. So yeah. if it's just spider mites, like, spider mites. Like, yeah. like the old boring spider mites, these might not work. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Becky, for, for clarifying that. <laughs> um, all right. Also, you know, uh, if, if you're fortunate enough to be in an area of Texas with the beautiful blooms of azaleas, they're just a little bit prettier than the jujube blooms that we just saw a little bit earlier there. Um, then you probably have also witnessed this type of damage on some of the leaves, not uncommon at all, whether it be in professional landscapes or at producers, if you're not uh, staying on top of it. Do any of you chat with Green Aggies folks uh, have any thoughts on what this damage may be caused by? Great myrtle bark scale. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Good one, Meng Meng. <laughs> so there wasn't this sorry go ahead air fine right yes like, yeah yeah lace bugs just going back quickly to mung mungs uh there is an azalea bark scale right that um originally was thought crate myrtle bark scale was a a host shift of the azalea bark scale but they are specific to the bark uh yeah so this is feeding on the foliage and yeah the, we have an azalea lace bug when you look on the back of these leaves you'll see these little frass spots. So this is their poop. This is not their immatures or their eggs. This is their excrement. And from a distance view, you can see here, this that's an adult. Can you all see my mouse on the screen? Yeah. Uh, so that's an adult uh, right there. Another adult right over here as well. So if we get a little bit closer, you can see the immatures are these uh, spiny little things almost look like uh, like a, almost like a white fly pupa, um, but it's the, it's the actively feeding stage and it's got these kind of spikes on it. And then the adults are uh, quite pretty, actually. They have this kind of lace type uh, features on them, hence the name lace bugs. And that's some of the shiniest poop around. <laughs> yeah, very shiny and glimmery. Absolutely. <laughs> that's a little right. bit of zaz to your azaleas. Yeah. Um, I, I, I have not in my experience anyway, seen, seen these bugs, uh, kill azaleas. Now, if you're in a nursery that, you know, it's probably very little tolerance in terms of their damage. So you'd want to be on top of managing them, but in a professional landscape type setting, 
there are some predators, you know, I saw a lizard a little bit earlier today. I wonder if they're eating some of the adults. Um, but, uh, you know, I, 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 would, I would be cautious about going too harsh um, on, on them for management because, again, you do have some beautiful blooms. You start getting these azalea ace bugs right at the time of the blooms. And you don't want to be hurting things that are feeding on said blooms. Uh, I got these other series of images of these little growths on live oaks. Any thoughts on what that could be? Pretty more to warp scale. <laughs> Look like little galls. <laughs> yeah, they look like galls. Scale. Oh, yeah. Who said that? Keith. Oh, hey, Keith. Hey, <laughs> How's it going? All right. Hey, yeah. Yeah, right on. So lacanium scale is a type of a hard or armored scale. Um, and, and this is like an oak lacanium scale. So they occur on oaks. So, um, you know, identifying the problem is the, is the, is the first part of, uh, of solving the, the issue. So in this case, being able to know that it's a scale and not a gall um, is going to make a big difference in terms of uh, management strategies and, and prevention in the future. So, yeah, really good. And then, ooh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And then there is an excellent little fact sheet written by North Carolina State University on uh, oak lacanium scale. So if you wanna access that, hold your camera to that right there, that little QR code, and that should uh, take you to that uh, specific publication. So the publication is not <clears throat> outdated like a dinosaur or something, right? <laughs> it may be. <laughs> no, it is not. That's just a, uh, a little um, plugin I have in my web browser that can automatically quickly create QR codes based on the web page I'm on. And it just, I don't know why it puts this little dinosaur I, in the middle. I wouldn't think you're a <laughs> dinosaur it. either. No. <laughs> I think every QR code should have a little dinosaur a in it. A little dinosaur actually. in it. In yeah. memory of the dinosaurs. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Since a lot of our, 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 our power source is derived from, you know, the, their decaying, well, long decayed bodies. <laughs> Um, uh, last thing is that the published paper that uh, I was talking about use of biologic control, uh, I do occasionally get questions to from growers um, asking and, and landscapers and sometimes people just with home gardens asking, you know, does biological control work? Can I use biological control or what can I use um, to release uh, to control these pests? Um, you know, the, the question, uh, the answer in the landscape is frequently just try and preserve what you have in the landscape and try and promote predators don't necessarily spend money to release things unless you're Disney World. Disney World is an exception because they make a lot of money and they have visitors there all the time. So they can't afford to, um, you know, stop the parks to, to spray stuff. But um, when we're talking about greenhouse settings, uh, recently, again, just published this paper on doing some commercial scale applications of releasing both a parasitic wasp and a predatory mite to manage white flies on poinsettias. And this particular paper is, is um, you know, almost like a guide. It, um, it's supposed to be help, you know, really growers to see exactly what we did. Uh, you know, what kind of scouting and monitoring did we do? What were our results? How did we collect data and tabulate that data to uh, know how to make certain management decisions? There's even tables in there of all the products that were used uh, at the different facilities. So these are all the, the commercial names, uh, the company that they come from, the active ingredient or the species. And then also, if you're wondering, am I overpaying for stuff, <laughs> right? So we actually you know, looked at multiple sources, some of which may have been from large growers, one directly from suppliers uh, or distributors and, and got an average price. Of, of what these products actually go for, because depending on, on who you are or the, the quantity you're, you're buying, um, that can vary a lot uh, in, in price. So that gives you an idea of, of that. We also did a very, uh, well, not very, we did a somewhat in-depth uh, economic analysis comparing biological control versus insecticide inputs. And that's also in that publication. So in summary, uh, some of the key takeaways uh, where that um, that it it's critical to have good monitoring data. So without the monitoring data, the um, the growers that relied on insecticides would have spent a lot more. And that's because we we have some historical data where they were basically you know you might be spraying on a weekly basis, even if it's just preventatively. 
But when you know exactly what's going on in a particular greenhouse, you can save some of those sprays and that saves on the labor and the actual product uh, involved in doing some of those applications, which is pretty huge. Um, next, it's important to have a backup arsenal of insecticides. So having some uh, insecticides that have a low residual or will have um, low impact on some of those beneficials, but that you can use to knock down high densities of, of pest populations. Um, and these are the two um, natural enemies that we used, Eremostos rumicus and Amblesius swirskii. Again, these two have shown to work well in our warmer climates and appear to work effectively to manage uh, white flies. Um, a binomial sampling plan may be quite viable. And, and what I mean by binomial is uh, you have a, let's say you have a greenhouse uh, within that particular house, you have 5,000 poinsettias. Um, you might sample, you only look at say a hundred of them or 50 of them. And all you're doing is presence absence. Yes, there's white flies on that plant or no. So you're looking at that plant for 60 seconds. And if you see a white fly within that 60 seconds, you can stop looking at it and put it down and go on to your next one. Because uh, what we found was that uh, the, the proportion of plants infested actually correlates pretty reasonably well with average number of white flies. So the higher proportion, as you start getting over 50% of your plants infested, the average number of white flies starts to increase quite uh, drastically because uh, especially those white flies are very unevenly distributed. Meaning uh, the more likely, if you're more likely to actually find them on a plant, it means more likely you have a very uh, widespread and, and higher infestation. And lastly, fire ant management is critical. Uh, and this is something we didn't anticipate, but uh, found at, at points. So these, these uh, parasitic wasp pupa are kind of like hanging on these cards. And uh, if there was fire ants, they would come and clean up those cards. In some cases within like two hours, there'd be no pupa left on those cards. Uh, so they're presumably collecting them as a good source of protein maybe to eat them. Um, and so you certainly don't want that happening because that's just feeding fire ants uh, with, with very expensive wasps. Uh, so those are some of the key takeaways. And again, you can look at that paper for more details or you can contact me directly if you're interested in implementing biological control in greenhouse production. And that's all I had from hey, that uh, fire ant thing just blew me away. I was like, right. Know, as if they're not bad enough, they just <laughs> beneficial insects right off the cards. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. That was kind of my, it was not fun. Uh, you know, the idea of having to pick up on study pots and having fire ants on my hands. And then, and then this, like, then they're like eating I, my wasp pupae. <laughs> like, <laughs> all right. We got to nuke these buggers. Okay, uh, can we, uh, 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 bring our attention back to create myrtle bark scale air fire. <laughs> we never talked about create myrtle bark scale. Our attention was I'm, never I'm there. <laughs> I, I'm very disappointed. You remember in the LSU, in the LSU trial, um, they also had uh, control issues when that tree has a fire ant mount. Laura, you remember that? I do. You remember that do. from one of the weekly uh, hangouts of the cream of bark scale group that, you know, the fire ants seem to be the problem. Yeah. So. Yeah, I was also gonna gonna say uh, that it's, it's common with other landscape pests uh, that, that uh, produce honeydew because they're sucking on the sap of the plant and producing honeydew. And, and fire ants uh, use that honeydew as a source of uh, carbohydrates in this time, in this case. Uh, and so uh, in addition to, you know, stealing the pupa of the parasitoids, they can also tend the ants, uh, tend the, 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 the sucking insect in this case, you know, a, a scale or a, or a mealybug and, and defend them from natural enemies. So oftentimes control of the sucking insects starts with control of the fire ants. Absolutely. Have you seen Carlos and them harvest pupae, up, like parasitic wasp pupae before? Yeah, in on, on researchers, uh, uh, on you know, <laughs> they only attack researchers. Research trials. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> one, one, it had, it had happened that, and so we had to. This was on a bench in a greenhouse. We had to uh, to put uh, uh, sticky stuff on the bench on the legs of the of the benches, and and that took care of it. Wow. 
Yeah, but Erfan, you said they were like up in the poinsettia pots, right? Like fire ants. Yeah, so the pots were sitting on the ground. Yeah. They were oh, they on were on the ground. ground. Oh, okay. Yeah, they this is like a uh, metal on frame hoop Not house. On on, okay. Yeah, on the ground. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Jeez. So I don't know whose slide this is, but I just want to say looking at it makes me feel like we should play some Sarah McLaughlin and have like an mm. in memoriam this is what i call the four <laughs> biggest losers uh, <laughs> in, down here in the in the houston area um so what i wanted to do is i just have a couple slides of of and i figured i'd start out with the bad news so the these are the ones i think that that definitely took the biggest hit whether in the landscape or even in the nursery um so calistamin uh the way that looked in February, it still looks that way. Uh, so the bottle brush plant, that first plant, um, is 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 looking really poor. Uh, the oleanders, the neriums, next one over, they are still looking rough. Now I did notice I, I've I've been a, uh, out of town for a week, and as I was driving in today, there's a lot of uh, nerium planted along I-10. Um, I see a branch or two coming up, but I would say overall they're they they really took a, a, a really bad hit. Um, next one up for, at the nursery, this Iliocarpus, the Japanese blueberry, um, that was all that was left. They just hadn't gotten around to scrapping it yet, but they had scrapped several um, uh, beds about that size, maybe even long, larger, uh, that made it to the uh, scrap heap and then last but not least uh, the raphiolepsis the uh indian hawthorn um are all looking uh still pretty rough i you see maybe a little growth here and there but in general these four probably took the biggest hit um like i said i i would call them the four biggest losers um from the february freeze down here so um but on the other side next slide there's always something positive happening so um, oh, no, this was still uh, on the bad side. I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't want to get your hopes up. Uh, I'm just teasing with your emotions here. Well, I have a quick question about uh, Indian Hawthorne. Um, availability for replacement plants. That's something people have been asking me about. And I guess, so did that also take a hit in nurseries? And there's just not much out there. I yeah, mean, I, I, I think the same thing. That unless they pulled blankets on them in the nursery. Yeah. Um, they, they, there's going to be um, very, very limited availability on them. Um, but I, I did see. Laura, I, th I think the issue is that uh, right now, any plants, any plants, any yeah. plants, yeah. even yeah. wax myrtles. I mean, any plants. Uh, it's yes. A very and short supply. It's like as soon, you know, like you remember, Alan. Alan Owens was saying that, you know, as soon as they put something on the availability list, yeah. like it's gone. So yeah. that's yeah. really just anything, everything. Yes, I think that's true for everything. I just think there's probably so much Indian Hawthorne out there uh, that that it's really one of the things driving replacements because. So, it, you know, it's going to be interesting because are, are, are the people that really took a hit with it are they even going to consider replanting it or not they are they seem going to, to think want to i don't know, you know it, 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 yeah. it might be yeah so yeah. you know i've heard several people master gardeners have called and said well i'm just right driving around the neighborhood i'm looking to see what that's survived and that's what i'm going back in with i'm not gonna you know go back in with the other stuff mm -hmm. um at the same nursery that i was at we did see some damage uh splitting on the bark so uh, this young seedling there, or this tree on the uh, left-hand side is Quercus fusiformis. And you can see along the, the base there how that had split. Um, but, the, you know, the tree still looked good. So, you know, the grower was hoping that it would just seal itself over and, and continue on. And then the one on the uh, right here, um, this is Quercus polymorpha. And so you could see that's, I think that was in a 65 gallon pot. Um, you could see some splitting. So, you, you know, at, at the nurseries, they were, they're, they're dealing with some of this, these issues still um, with bark damage, um, with, with complete losses of some crops. So um, there, there's, uh, you know, they, they've got their challenges that they're working through. Um, but then again, um, next slide now, this should be positive, I hope. Um, we're also seeing our sagos make it back, um, which I was surprised because I, uh, especially as soon as they're coming back now, 
Um, so here's just two images where you can see the, the fronds are, are, are emerging. Um, and this one on the left uh, went by this morning and now they're about a foot and a half long and, and you know, opening up. So they're, they're looking much better. So, um, you know, it, it was difficult and we were getting a lots of questions about what do I do, what do I do? And, you know, um, you know, if, if you had the patience to sit and wait, uh, a lot of these, the, the plants are a lot more resilient than what, you know, you, you probably assume they would be. And so just giving them that, that time to come back uh, is key. Uh, next slide. I One thing on sagos up here, of course, it's cold, it got colder and, and they're probably not as well adapted either, but there are some where you can just pull out the center and it's yep. mush. And that's, yep. that's yep. the end. Yeah. When that's, that, that, when that that's happens. been the case down on, on certain ones, um, on certain ones yeah. but, but majority of them uh, are, are starting to flush. This is a, a, is just a, a small demonstration arboretum in Katy here. And um, um, it, it's interesting, these three palms, you can see how close they are to one another. Uh, so you got Trachycarpus on the left-hand side. So that is uh, the windmill palm. You've got Washingtonia robusta, uh, which is the Mexican fan palm. And then you've got the sable texana, which is the sable palm. So you can see there's three degrees of, of resistance or cold tolerance, however you want to call it. The, the Trechocarpus looks great. It, it was nice and green as it came through. The Washingtonia from a distance probably is places third, probably took the biggest hit. Um, doesn't look like it's going to make it. Uh, and then the sable texana has some, you know, tip damage, um, but majority is green in through there. So, um, you know, the, the sable texana uh, looks pretty good. But if you get up closer to the Washingtonia, uh, same thing. If we can go to the next slide, uh, we can see in that growing point, there's fronds that are coming. So, again, this is where, you know, uh, I'm, I'm sure people were tired of us giving them this answer, and we were probably tired of answering questions saying, just be patient, give the plant some time. Um, but they were responding. They were, they, they are recovering. They are coming back. Um, you know, so this is one where, you know, I, I would let that emerge a little bit more, clean up the dead stuff and um, let that plant as the, the heat kicks in down here, uh, they're going to emerge and elongate and that, that, that plant's going to be back on its, uh, you know, up and running. So um, j just a few slides to give you an idea of what's going on down here um, after the February freeze. All right, turf grass issues, last but not least. Um, so we decided we would just basically do the same thing that everyone else has done, going through their emails and find some photos of some questions we've been getting recently. So one of the largest issues we've been getting <laughs> but um <laughs> is large patch questions and as you can see these disease issues are left over from last fall and so commonly we will see um you know, as our grasses start transitioning to uh, actively growing in the spring, we can easier, it's a lot easier for us to see the damage from last year. So the most common question is what do we do? Should we spray it with a fungicide? Is it going to come back? What do I do? Um, well, the, the answer to that is we do not recommend a spring fungicide application unless that disease becomes active. We do want to uh, stop any activity that's going on, but in this case, these are just leftover um, patches from the fall disease with no activity currently occurring, and it really depends on how severe your disease was in the fall whether or not it will recover in the spring. And so sometimes we, we can see very um, uh, lower severity cases recovering in the spring and summer once it starts getting warmer. Um, we do suggest, you know, if it's possible to clean out some of that dead material as well. Uh, in some cases though, resodding is going to be what you're gonna have to do. Um, you know, a lot of this, if it's super severe, if it's basically killed the crown of the plant and also caused root damage, then there's really nothing we can do, right? And so in large, large, severe cases, we might have to resod. Which in large, in large, large patch large, cases. Large, large, large patch large. cases. 
So, which brings us to another issue, sod availability, right? Um, yep. You know, I just took a trip down south to some of our sod farms in the Houston area. It was actually in Wharton, um, and we've seen some losses. And so we haven't gotten a report on, you know, how severe it is yet, but we do have some losses. And Becky um, Miles has already cut all of his palmetto and all of his Raleigh this year. Yeah. And so... I it's pretty I much had a, <laughs> I had a similar talk with another grower, John Romine, who told me that he has growers from other parts of the state calling him and begging him to you have extra sod on hand for yeah. me to fill orders. It, it's, it's definitely an issue. I would say if you have healthy areas and you can plug from healthy areas in your existing yard, that may be a better temporary solution because it may be a while before you can really get your hands on certain materials. For sure. And, but, you know, there, there could be a possibility since they cut so early in the year for it to regrow this year, and they could potentially cut late this year, especially if you're in the Southern part of the state. Yeah. Um, so that's a hope, but yeah, when we were driving around that sod farm and you just see acres and acres of bare ground, I was like, it's not even May yet. And all the sod is gone. So uh, that's going to be um, another thing we have to battle this year. It's just availability. So um, we can move on to the next slide. Um, One of the pictures disappeared. Yeah, I know. Oh, well, it might have got in at the last minute uh, <laughs> and it didn't get updated. So another another big question we've been having, you know, weeds are very visible right now, especially winter weeds. We have seed heads, we have flowering structures uh, all over the place. And so this is the time of year we start getting questions about what should we do to control these winter weeds? Well, um, we really shouldn't do uh, very much right now in the way of herbicide um, control because these weeds are very mature. Uh, this is not a great time to be trying to control them. Um, once they get uh, flowering structures, reproductive structures, they're just going to be harder and harder to control. Plus, we are also in the transition period for some of our grasses still. And, and using these post-emergent products not only um, or may not have as much activity on the weeds, but may also slow the green up of some of our grasses. Um, so the best way to really manage these if possible is if, if you can catch the clippings, right? If you can mow, catch your clippings. Um, I was actually pretty surprised to see our HOA service out there that we, we contract out um, mowing with bags the other day. And so uh, that's gonna prevent our weed seed from spreading around and prevent some, some more issues next year. Becky, do you wanna say anything about that? Yeah, I mean, the other thing that I would just say is that we are rapidly moving into a time of year where, where you should be more concerned about the young summer annuals that are barely on your radar, but by July, August are gonna start to really bother you. And at that point, it's too late for them. And so, you know, like Christy said, we do want to be discerning right now as our turf grasses are, are still kind of warming up for the year. Some are looking better than others. And I've got a picture on the next slide of, um, which we don't have to go to yet, but I have a picture on the next slide of, we still are seeing St. Augustine can be a little sluggish depending on where it is and the variety. Um, but once you feel confident, you know, you're out there mowing the turf pretty frequently, you feel confident that it's actively growing. If you're concerned about anything, I would be looking for those young summer annuals and treating those while they're vulnerable, paying more attention to those than these winter annuals um, that, that we've kind of missed the window because that'll be really helpful at minimizing your, your headache later in the season. And so a lot of times this, this time of year, those get overlooked because they're, they're covered in, in chickweed and henbed and, and we don't notice them as much, but those are the ones that are going to be the easiest to control right now. So but the, the plus side is if you do have these winter weeds out there, this is a great time to, you know, write down what issues you had this year. And so we can prepare for our fall pre-emergent application regarding what annual weeds we did see out there. Yep. Yep. I agree. M many of our most challenging winter weeds are annuals. And so having a good pre-emergence herbicide program is going to be very important. And from a professional standpoint, recognizing that many of the pre-emergence herbicides that we may tend to reach for may not have good uh, efficacy on broadleaf weeds. Mm -hmm. So in particular, if you are seeing a lot of broadleaf winter annuals, that may mean that you need to swap to a product that has a broader spectrum of control, something like indazoflam, 
or add something like uh, isoxaben or choose a product. There's some products that combine isoxaben and other active ingredients like dithiapyr or pendomethalin um, to make sure that you can get control of some of those broadleaf weeds that, that maybe some of your other products are not, not getting good control of. Um, I did also wanna make a comment. I'm seeing a lot of clover right now. This is the time of year I get a lot of questions about clover. I am a big advocate for leaving clover alone. So I always like to take a little moment to say that. I, I understand that in certain high impact turf systems where we have very high expectations for aesthetics and functionality that we don't have that luxury. But if you manage you know, public facilities, parks, things like that, clover, first of all, when it's flowering is a big pollinator supporter. So when we put out products on those flowers, we're going to interfere with pollinator activity. It's, I always see bees all over these every time I'm out. Clovers can also be beneficial from the standpoint of improving soil structure and helping with our nitrogen loads in the soil. They are legumes. Um, they don't necessarily contribute nitrogen, but what they will do is create a little bit better balance because they're not necessarily taking a bunch of nitrogen out of that soil. So a lot of benefits that can come from just kind of leaving them there. They don't tend to get super tall. They mow easily. They look, I think they look cute. Uh, maybe that's not the right word, but <laughs> They look cute. And so in situations like, uh, you know, if you are managing, I see them all over right now on the Chisholm Trail here in Plano, you know, in, in the Buffalo and turf areas and, and city of Plano is not trying to get rid of those or anything that I can see. And so if you have the option of leaving them, please leave them. Um, and if you have to get rid of them, you know, try to do what you can to, even with herbicides, I recommend if you can mow off the flowers before you put a product on it, that's my preference so that we can reduce the types of things that our bees come into contact with. Um, and so I just wanted to make that little comment. <laughs> so. You can go to the next slide. Yeah, so I just wanted to say that I have seen pretty nice green up so far of in particular Bermudas and zoysia grasses. Actually, the, the Palisade zoysia at the Dallas Center greened up super quickly. It looks really good already. Um, some of the St. Augustines are still slow. So I was, you know, I'm not seeing injury to the point that I think there's, there's going to have to be a ton of replacement here in, in Dallas. There may be some areas that we'll have to replace, but I am seeing some really sluggish. So this is my yard and this part down here, that's kind of in the bottom right-hand corner is actually getting closer to the house in the shade. So the snow took longer to melt there. And I'm wondering if that may have been beneficial in insulating the turf for a longer period. And as you go out into the main part of the yard, the, the green up is a little spottier. There's definitely some winter injury there. And so, you know, like what Chrissy was saying, this is an area that I'm probably not going to want to hit anytime soon with a broadcast herbicide application. This is an area that's going to be a little more vulnerable for a while. And so making sure that if I've provided sufficient nitrogen at this point in the year, it's okay for us to put out or have put out some nitrogen because we are actively growing and that's gonna help support recovery. Likewise, if you've done soil testing for the facilities you manage, you know, applying phosphorus, potassium as needed um, to just make sure it has everything it needs. If you're seeing this kind of pattern in, in your St. Augustine areas, Laura, I don't know, are you seeing any injury like this in Fort Worth? Yeah, we are. We are yeah. definitely. It's not as bad as I expected. No, no. But. And I'm all, and I am seeing new growth coming out, yes. you know, so that's, yes. so I, I've been telling people, you know, just hand pull your weeds. If you see them, you know, try to give it a little time, be patient and it's, it's gonna fill in. Yeah. Um, yeah. If you're seeing quite a bit more yellow, Becky, would you recommend dethatching and or removing said dead grass or is that usually not necessary? Um, so in St. Augustine grass, sometimes some of those cultivation practices, we have to be especially careful because in zoysia and Bermuda grass, those are rhizomatous grasses. So they have rhizomes in the soil that are protected. And so, you know, Chrissy was just talking about harvest. So we can go out, for example, on a sod farm and literally scrape every piece of vegetation off of a Bermuda field and it'll grow back. But in the case of St. Augustine, they spread primarily via stolons. They do not have rhizomes. And so when they're vulnerable like this, and then we do a lot of intense mechanical cultivation, I would be a little concerned about doing that right now. I, I 
I, this is, we are at a time of moving into a time of year where, where thatch removal it's in particular on zoysia and Bermuda grass, this is a pretty good time to do it. We've got a lot of natural rainfall. The temperatures are not too high yet. It's actively growing and can recover. Um, but I don't know that I would do that in response to this winter injury on St. Augustine. I don't know, Chrissy, what do you think? Um, I agree with that. Um, I've been tell I've been, uh, telling folks the risk of, you know, of doing that and, and being too tough on it, uh, especially this early. And so um, I wouldn't recommend doing that either. Instead, what I would probably recommend or fun actually is um, just making sure that you're doing some pretty regular mowing. Um, so, so doing this is going to stimulate more of that lateral growth and provided that we're doing it at a short enough interval, we won't have scalping injury or, or the added stress. And so mowing just a little bit more frequently right now to stimulate that lateral growth might be really beneficial in helping with recovery and green up overall. Um, but, but this is a good time of year. If you have zoysia in particular is one, if, if you manage zoysia facilities, especially if you're fairly new to it, cultivation is almost a must for really making them last and having them be successful. Um, and so, you know, I would say every one to three years minimum, um, at, it varies a little depending on the cultivar and the system that you're managing, but, um, it can be good to get out this time of year and, and do a little thatch management. It'll help reduce susceptibility to large patch disease. If you, you know, professional landscapers, if, if you, um, if you're managing some zoysia lawns and it's kind of a new experience for you. This is one of those things that may be a little different about these types of lawns, you know, not that we don't do thatch management in Bermuda, but I would say we have more issues sometimes with thatch buildup in zoysia, especially fine textured zoysia grasses. And what, what is very common to see is about two to three years after installation, the sod looks great for like two years, and then it just starts to decline. There starts to be weed encroachment. The turf is, for lack of a better word, starting to choke itself out. And, and, and you're just looking at it like, what's happening? I don't understand. I'm doing everything the same. And a lot of times it's because of that, that thatch buildup. Um, and so um, this is a good time of year to think about that. But for these injured St. Augustine grasses, I would say focus more on good frequent mowing, making sure you're meeting all of your nutrient demands, doing a little soil test if you haven't already for the year so that if you are missing other things, uh, phosphorus, which is going to be really important for root growth, potassium, or even some of your micronutrients, you're aware of that and you can respond to that. We that was like perfect timing, you guys. Yeah. Like right that was pretty good hour. timing. Yeah. <laughs> All of you who just, you know, really wanted to talk about jujubes, you got your thing in. So hey, Airphone, I think Dr. Ong is in the uh, He is. Room. Yes, yeah. he is. Yes. I okay. met him co-host. Now, very quickly, um you can have... I did not I did not update the uh, the survey. Oh, so... I wasn't yeah, I wasn't sure if we wanted to do one today or not. Um why not? Just rip it up. <laughs> <laughs> so uh give it five minutes before it's updated but then we would always appreciate uh your feedback um on on our programming so we always know how to improve we know what we're doing well or not doing so well and it also helps us demonstrate some kind of impact that's that's our our, our currency in agri life right we don't we don't charge you money but we need to demonstrate that what we're doing matters uh so if you can take a moment to complete that survey i will also put it here in the chat and just wait probably three more minutes. Uh, well, and I think, on, yeah. I think Erfan, what you're trying to say is that Dr. Ong should really jump on here for about five minutes. And <laughs> well, no, no, no. Say, say one, say one minute, because then it'll be more like 10 minutes. And uh, <laughs> really significant. And <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, hey, Kevin, do you have anything that you're seeing a lot of, or would like to, to share with us? Leave me okay. out. Okay. All right, yeah. Dr. Ong, that's fine. Um, so still being I, leafed out from last time. Yeah, 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 yeah. I gotcha. I, I, the thing that uh, we were talking about a little bit, and Chrissy said that her dog brought one in the house is slugs and snails are super happy right now with the weather we've been having. So um, I've gotten a couple of questions about, oh, it's updated now. So if you don't want to hear me ramble on about iron Perfect. Good stop, Laura. Um, stop right there. Um, but iron phosphate products are, are 
are safe and effective. I, I had a couple questions about those. I do recommend them. So they are good. Um, of course, if you just want to put out a thousand little saucers of beer, your, your slugs will probably <laughs> die a happier day. So. Oh, what a sad waste of beer though. Maybe if you I, have some I, cruddy I, beer. Get some, get some cheap beer, some yeah. flat beer. I don't know. Right, anyway. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, survey so what, 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 what not working. Not, the survey's still not loading for me. Oh, okay. Oh, oh it's not even loading. It no. should at least load. No, Please, we know that we can count on you. Thank you. And so, Laura, are you trying to say that they should not be a slug about completing the survey? Uh, yeah. hey, hey guys. <laughs> Well, maybe they should be sluggish since it's not updating. Yeah, so that's fast. true. I mean, Dr. Ong <laughs> has something to say. Dr. Ong has something to say. All right. Since you guys won't leave me alone, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll share a picture of leaves from roses. And this was actually posted, I believe, last Friday on, on the Plant Clinic Facebook asking folks what might cause something like this. Now, if you think you know the answer, stick it in the chat. Um, I was supposed to put the answer on Facebook and Instagram on Monday, but I got kind of shut down from my second vaccine dose. So I thought I put an answer up sometime, but apparently I guess I did that in my dreams. So I'll probably share that after you guys get a chance to try and figure out what's wrong with this. Come on, guys, you can do it. Spider mites? I was going to say, well, we might know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Air France says spider mites. So you guys can upvote on that or somebody give a different answer. But Air France, you didn't say it right. Spider mites. Might. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> the explanation there. Or maybe thrips? Oh, we got a uh, vote for thrips from Dr. Do. I have uh, a broad mite. Broad mite. Ooh, you got a broad mite guess. Is it, is, it a living, is it a living organism that caused it? No questions, just answers. <laughs> I mean, we gotta Leave always throw in, we gotta always throw in like herbicide damage, right? Herbicide damage. It's probably herbicide oh, damage. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, Mung Mung Goo is circling something. Uh, uh, that looks like yeah. some kind of stippling damage right there. That's right. Yeah. So that could be thrips, could be spider mites. Uh, I like the use of the pin. Yeah. Uh -huh. Dr. Ong, uh, uh, this is Carlos. I'm going to say, to me, it looks like old aphid damage. Ooh. Ooh. Ooh Dr. Bulgran goes with aphid damage. Not fresh aphid damage, but last year's oh. aphids, huh? Or earlier. <laughs> earlier. earlier. Yeah, uh, but you know what Mong Mong circled, uh, not sure if it's the same plant, but that looks like stippling that would be a, a leaf, uh, a leaf miner, adult, that oh. does, does kind of that stippling kind of damage. Others, other insects too, but this is very noticeable individual little uh, burnt, uh, you know, that's what the leaf miner adults like agro, uh, agromycid, uh, liriomysa, uh, leaf miners do. Mm -hmm. You know, would it change your opinion if I told you what Mang Mang Goo, Dr. Goo circle around there is not necessarily on the surface of the leaf? Got it. Yeah, here's the thing kevin you gotta give us all the information you know yeah. no, right now the way what... that we're approaching it is like you know you blind you you uh blindfold you know, our <laughs> eyes and then you know and we're looking we're approaching this big elephant in the room and i'm gonna say snake uh laura gonna say it's a tree somebody say it's gonna be a rope so you yeah. uh yeah Ke you're kevin Kevin actually doesn't even know. He's actually trying to get trying us. Trying to get it. <laughs> yeah. so I'm going to make a suggestion. No, I, I got to let you guys experience what I experience every day. Well, we That's experience why it every I'm day, so too. I'm so glad, so. Becky, you um, let me have that, that, that term. I'm going to milk it for the rest of this term. Leave me alone. <laughs> Just tell us the answer. <laughs> well, I, would, I would remove you, it right here. 
Right this was an interesting thing. Okay. If you flip over those leaves, I wish I took a picture of that. The answer would be very obvious. And, and, and you know what was real interesting about the type of answers was Airfun gave the right answer of the go. And I probably bet that was a gut reaction. And so listen to the entomologist. The funny part was we could sway him with all this other stuff, <laughs> which is pretty <laughs> cool. I wonder if we could sway him and said, hey, that was hamburger damage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, anyway, I'm going to stop sharing. I thought you guys would just have fun with it. So um, real quick, this was a rose bush that we kind of just left in the greenhouse, um, you know, over the winter. And it, it put out a new bunch of leaves. And this just happened all within about a week. So. And that almost go. looked that almost looked like it was above the surface. And that's why I thought. Spider Man. It almost looks like those webbing was stuff on top of it. Uh, there were very sparse web webbing from that image from the top, but when you flip it on the underside, it was That's very obvious. Very obvious. Which is which is a lesson. Always look underneath the leaf. Yeah, absolutely. That's where the poop is. Do not the <laughs> that's where the daddy is. Okay. What is it? Don't don't leave anything unturned. Unturned. Don't leave a leaf unturned. <laughs> Oops. All right. here. I'm trying to present. What else can I use with the word E? I don't know. I don't know, man. Okay. Ooh, next week, Dr. Apple. Super cool. Looking forward to that. Yeah, and it'll also include if you're looking for a pesticide applicator CEU, make sure you are on time for that and that you are able to stay for that full um, one hour presentation. And uh, as long as you register before and afterwards, you will be eligible for one pesticide applicator general uh, CEU. Excellent. Well, thank you all. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Dr. Ong, for not leaving us alone. We appreciate it. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, thanks everybody for, for um, hanging in there and, and really please, anytime, send us a question. Uh, let us know what you're seeing and thinking about and concerned about. We, we want to try to address those issues. So anytime, doesn't have to be the end of the month. Anytime. Thank you very much. All right. See y'all next week. Yeah. Bye.